Hello, I'm Jonathan Damonti, and I'm here to present to you a webinar about bone therapy for treating neurological conditions. So without much further ado, I'll go to a uh, slide presentation and uh, we'll have a look at that um, at this moment. There we go. Great. So. Bowen therapy for neurological problems. And uh, I'm Jonathan DeMonte and a uh, Bowen therapist located in Salt Spring Island, on Salt Spring Island, in the west coast of uh, British Columbia, Canada. And um, yeah, very happy to, to reignite the webinar series. Uh, it's been a while since the last one, and um, yeah, I'm just very glad that uh, we've got. Uh, got a new one on, on, on the go. So um, let's have a look at the slides. Here we are. I have to do it like this because the play will just show black on the website. Okay, hopefully this is all working and you're able to hear me. Um, I know there were some problems earlier. And um, anyway, here we go. Another round of the webinar. So we're going to talk first a little bit about the anatomy of the nervous system and some of the pathologies you'd expect to, to see from the, the problems within it. It's a complex system and uh, is a self-contained unit and is the body's control of coordination for the peripheral nervous system, the skeletal muscles, organ systems of the body. So it's a very complex system. It's made up of um, five components. First are the neurons, which are the nerve cells. Uh, gila are the supporting cells of the central nervous system structurally. There are uh, other cells called microglial, which are um, very important in the sort of uh, reactive patterns of inflammation and demyelinating conditions. So this is something that, uh, as Bowen therapists, we, we certainly have an effect on. Uh, it's bound together by connective tissue, and that's named the meninges and perivascular fibroblasts. And then it's all uh, innervated by uh, blood vessels, which are uh, similar to everywhere else in the body, excepting the capillaries, where uh, there's a a different system to prevent bleeds into and, and entering, entering into the blood-brain barrier. So it's a very, very um, complex system. There's a lot of, lot of uh, biology involved in, in understanding it. And uh, this isn't really the, uh, the webinar for that. This is more relating to a sort of structure of information to give us some thoughts about how to manage neurological um, problems with, with Bowen therapy and what can we can expect from, from using it. So here are some of the conditions of the, of the central nervous system. We have uh, um, brain swelling, and, and of course brain swelling could come from many sources. Um, it could be from injury, infection, and so on and so forth. There may be uh, space occupying lesions, and uh, this is not as uncommon as you might think. There are often uh, cysts, fatty cysts within the within the cranium and the central nervous system that, that you could, you know, um, you know, come across uh, either from sym symptomatically or even a diagnostic uh, description of them. Herniations could be uh, a, a big impact on the uh, central nervous system, and that could be you know, anywhere on the spine. Trauma to the central nervous system is probably one of the more common, common areas that we would be seeing in practice, be it from concussion or uh, bulging discs of the back and, and injuries and falls. Uh, motor vehicle accidents are a big, big uh, aspect to that. Uh, spinal cord injuries could, could you know, be mild enough that you get to see them. And then compressions, which is probably the, the manifestation of those injuries. And uh, those you'll definitely see or have seen quite a bit. 
uh, intervertebral disc prolapse, bulging discs. Um, uh, definitely you'll see spondylosis from uh, calcification around the root canal of the vertebrae. So this caused by osteoarthritis. Um, hydrocephalus would again be uh, from, from uh, infection. Um, hypoxic damage you know, uh, is uh, lack of oxygen to the, to the central nervous system and brain. Uh, strokes and cerebral infarcts are, are certainly you know, things you're going to see a lot. And uh, infections, post-meningeal uh, infections, you know, viral infections, you'll often see how they affect the central nervous system. Uh, there are um, you know, different types of conditions, and one of those is demyelinating conditions, and the most common is uh, seen in, in multiple sclerosis. And that could have been caused by many, many factors, and commonly viral um, or chemical, but in our part of the world, most likely viral and uh, immunological response that, that caused the uh, immune system itself to demyelinate the, uh, the nervous system. Clinically, you'll see the high incidence of limb weaknesses and paresthesia, which is, uh, you know, the kind of numbness and disenfranchising of the gait and, and the way the muscles move. It's uh, a really a huge problem. And you might find uh, some clients with, with these problems having great relief with, with the therapy. And uh, so it could become part of their treatment plan. Um, optic uh, problems, neuritis and diplopia, not so much effect, but uh, you know you could definitely try bladder and vertigo. Uh, these these could be helped with bone therapy definitely. So that's a, a kind of idea about uh, MS that um, that I uh, that I have is that really it's a palliative therapy and a very good one because uh, the impact of the therapy is often long-lasting and therefore the accessibility becomes greater for, for these clients because they can come less frequently and still gain great benefit. The uh, peripheral nervous system is um, constructed of myelinated and non-myelinated uh, nerves and the uh, commonest injury or, or pathology is neuropathy. Di peripheral neuropathy or even diabetic neuropathy is very common and we also see it with um, uh, alcohol abusers and so on. In uh, treating the uh, limb symptoms of MS, Parkinson's and for me uh, um, neuropathies, I've taken the approach of uh, using Bowen therapy in a different order whereby I'll actually have the client lay supine and I'll treat their knees and then their feet involving the knee procedure followed by the ankle and the hammer toes, the bunion procedure, plantar fasciitis. And what this does is it just really opens up those tissues, really softens any spasm that's inherently there due to the dysfunction and the great effort of of work those limbs have to do. They tend to wear an inordinate amount of tension. And then I return the client onto their, into their prone position, laying flat on their tummy. And I'll do the BRMs plus whatever indicated procedures might be there for that client that day. And um, then at the end, I'll redo their legs and feet uh, as a secondary um, treatment. So for some therapists, this might seem like a lot, but bear in mind there's two, two levels of the treatment, in a sense. You know, there's the treatment of the peripheral um, tensions in the, in the structures of the limbs, and then there's the central nervous system. Well, if there's, if there's a softening of the, of the um, region of concern, uh, then, then the central nervous system can have a greater response. And in my experience, it seems to go that way. You know, these clients tend to need to do a lot of therapy. They need to do a lot of exercise. They need to keep their bodies moving. And uh, you, you can't let up. And in many ways, I think 
this is a, a more a sort of physiotherapy than it is a Bowen therapy in this in this manner. But um, there'll be time for doing it both ways. There'll be time where you'll do a minimalist session, and then other times where you where you really go at it with a lot of therapy. So um, other neurogenic conditions might be, uh, you know, the dystrophies, inflammatory myopathies, where um, which is very common to see um, conditions like uh, fibromyalgia, polymyalgia. These are, could all have been caused by an inflammatory action to an infection, some sort of uh, uh, viral infection, even a parasite perhaps. Uh, you, know, you add to that the state of the person in, in at the onset of those conditions, oftentimes it's a time of great burnout. And um, you know, for whatever reason, we see it more in women than in men. And um, you know, here bone therapy is you know fantastic in its use and its effect on the nervous system there. So uh, I didn't talk much about dystrophy or the or uh, you know we don't see that very much. Um, the muscle wasting and weakness of peripheral neuropathies I've talked about, and that was mentioning in MS Parkinson's. Um, sometimes lumbar compressions can cause very similar symptoms to these neurological uh, conditions, and you do see muscle wasting, weakness, effect, affectations of the gait, and so on. And then there are the toxic um, and congenital myopathies, sometimes caused by alcohol use and sometimes steroids, actually, even uh, so-called healthy steroids like corticosteroids. Um, there are disorders of, uh, of the neuromuscular transmission, so we might see conditions like myasthenia gravis, lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome, and uh, um, kind of a very important syndrome that you might come across um, is complex regional pain syndrome. And it's hard to put it into words, uh, you know, the intensity of this condition. It's uh, it's, it's beyond um, what we'd normally expect as a pain scenario. These patients are untouched by, by the narcotics, they're untouched by therapies, they're untouched by, by um, nerve blocks, um, and so on. And, and these pain syndromes are, are incredibly difficult to treat. There are uh, huge waiting lists for, for modern medical treatment for these conditions. There are sometimes surgical interventions whereby nerve uh, disruptors can be put in that electronically um, block the nerves. And uh, so you may come across clients with this condition, maybe undiagnosed, and it might explain some of the intensity of what they experience. And something I'm seeing a lot of lately is uh, electromagnetic field sensitivity. And um, this from the uh, widespread um, use of microwaves in our environment now, be it from cell phones, cell towers, Wi-Fi modems, um, even satellite Wi-Fi emissions, and uh, hydrometers that uh, communicate with the Wi-Fi. So we're, we're seeing more and more of these clients with incredible effects from these microwaves, and they are so vulnerable. And some of the conditions they're experiencing affect their inflammatory state. They have a high state of inflammation and pain. They have um, brain function disorders, brain fog, uh, energy dysfunction, they have emotional effect, they have digestive effect, so very, very strong reactions. And uh, this therapy can be very useful for these syndromes. So here's a case of um, a 72-year-old female uh, whose initial complaint was, uh, she described it as a sciatic-like inf inflammation affecting the right limb and her gait. It started five years earlier when she'd suffered an episode of shingles, and um, this erupted across her sacrum. It was treated with uh, standard medical treatment, which was uh, 
you know, the antivirals, probably a, 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 a shingles vaccine and um, medication, heavy narcotics, um, Lyrica, Gabapentin, all of the nerve um, and spasm medicines doctors can throw at you. Uh, she spent almost a year um, unable to move uh, out of bed. She um, uh, you know, went through a lot, a lot to get even to where she is now. So this is five years later. Right now she's basically got a sciatica-like syndrome where she's got pain in certain parts of her back, her calf, her Achilles. She can't um, move or walk properly. She can't dorsiflex or plantar flex her foot, nor can she raise it as she walks. She's got constant pain in the calf and um, just behind the knee, um, on the calf, just below the knee. And um, there was a history of a Baker cyst. She thought it was a, a factor. And it's possible that there were there, that is a factor. Um, she can't lay flat on, on, on her heel when lying down. And uh, generally, she can't govern her whole leg. But the pain in, the, in and around the piriformis, this can erupt into a kind of vibration that refers through the whole limb. And uh, she's prone to vertigo and has balance, balance problems and falls easily. She actually did have a fall during this time and had a, a slight concussion. So um, first treatment, you could uh, uh, say that I observed you know, her gait and the amount of muscle spasm, her posture and so on. But really, and as a burn therapist, your assessment comes during, during the treatment phase. So I uh, interpreted a, a strong vitality for her. In other words, that, that she was quite strong at this point after five years of recovery and she'd done uh, you know, withdrawal completely from all drugs. She used many therapies from cranial to chiro to physio to massage and so on. And um, yeah, I felt, I felt she had a good vitality. So I went ahead and did um, basic relaxation moves one two and three. And uh, during the BRM2, I applied the optional moves, 8A and 8B. And I usually uh, put in moves 15 and 16 as a completion of the back optional moves, 8A and 8B, as per the back spasm procedure. And then I come back after a short pause to redo moves one to eight of BRM2, then another pause, and then one, 9 to 16 of BRM2. So I find that a very useful protocol. I think a lot of people respond in, a, in, an, in a, an additional amplitude, a kind of, it's a, it's a greater response for my clients when I, when I do the optional moves. So it gives them more time to process the, the procedures it gives them a sense of having more done to them. And uh, generally, I think there's just a only, only a benefit. I've never seen an aggravation from, from applying those extra procedures. After which, I would have assessed to do the sacral release procedure. I wouldn't do it blindly. Um, when I say assessed the sacral procedure, the sacral release procedure. This is different than the sacrum procedure, which is what we do standing. This is sacral release, which is a procedure done to release the uh, lateral border of the uh, sacrum on both sides, where it inserts uh, with the gluteus maximus muscle. And uh, that's in the manuals. You'll be able to read about that. If you have problems finding that information, let me know. After which, um, I did the knee procedure and the, and the footwork. When I do the footwork, it's all the footwork. I do ankle, hammer toe, bunion, and plantar fasciitis all at once. Good. So she came back a week later and um, reported an interesting and um, I think very helpful piece of information 
that uh, during the evening of that first visit, she had the sensation as if the shingles were going to come, um, exactly like when it first happened. And she felt sure the shingles were, were going to come back and was very anxious about that. She was irritated, hot, sleepless. And then the next day, all was calm. The shingles didn't come. And um, in my mind, a return of old symptoms is always a very positive thing, especially when it's short-lived like that. It's extremely positive. And, um, you know, it's as if the body is revisiting how it dealt with this problem in the first place. So you can only expect a positive outcome after time. Last night, before the night before she came back for the second treatment, she had the best sleep she'd had in years. A new symptom, she said, was a, a faintness. And uh, she was reporting sensations in her feet as if it was wearing a glove and uh, as if it had a, a pad under her foot. Her back and lower limbs had generally less cramps. And, uh, of course, that's a good sign. So all went very, very well with the first visit, as is often the case with Bowen therapy first visits. They're almost the easiest. Uh, the first visit is somehow easy. You switch off the inflammatory state of the body in such an efficient way, and it just knows what to do with that. It's the second visits that are often the hardest. So now we... Uh, uh, did uh, another round of treatment and we did the same thing again BRMs 1, 2, 3, 8, A, 8, B and this time I did the hamstring and the knee I combine these quite often and then also the feet and all of the footwork procedures again so the second uh, uh, third treatment came two weeks later and uh, basically she reports being so much better unrigid less tense and on edge more energy, more present. Her symptoms today in this third visit is that there's sacrum tightness and you can see a slight rotation in it. She's got moderate spasms in her limb and in the tibialis tendon just behind the, uh, the calf at the, uh, just below the knee and her Achilles tendon as well. So this time I did uh, BRMs again, uh, pelvis, and then the footwork. I, I put in brackets here, check the sacrum, because it would have been in my mind very much to check the sacrum if I didn't do sacral release this time. And um, I always check the sacrum, I will say that, because it's easily overlooked if you don't get in the habit of always checking your client's gait after they get up from the treatment session. You can see a lot in how they move their hips and how the sacrum, whether it has mobility or not, whether the mobility is more on one side or the other. It's train yourself. You can definitely learn how to see those, uh, those differences. So, and then, and then I put it here just to discuss it, but I didn't actually do the sacrum standing pr procedure. At this point, I'm also considering two procedures that are very specific for her problem. One of them is called burning heel, and the other is called the deep sciatic. These are um, essential tools for treating sciatica in general, and um, different kinds of neurological problems in the, in the lower limb. So I'm going to show uh, the details of the uh, burning heel procedure. This is the scan from the manual itself. And uh, I'll just zoom in so you can read it. Actually, I'll zoom out and let you take a, a screenshot. So perhaps that'll come out clearly. And perhaps if you have problems, just let me know and I can send this out to you. Okay, so the indications for the burning hill procedure, sciaticas that refer into the foot, heel pain, sensitivity. So this is the person who has um, a neuroma underneath the pad of the heel, the calcaneal pad. That's a fatty pad that can be uh, displaced by the gait relating to um, 
you know, the alignment of the rest of the body, and you'll see that um, these procedures are generally prerequisite, but you may have done them that session or previous sessions, it doesn't matter. You could alternate pelvis and knee procedures with hamstring procedure if you wanted, but in general, you get the idea. Um, and be specific to the client that, that um, you know, you follow their needs, give them what they need, not what you, you read they need, because it says prerequisite. Uh, in any case, um, it's a procedure for that heel pain, and uh, also useful for plantar fasciitis. It's definitely useful for a ruptured Achilles tendon, and uh, any time you see atrophy of the calf muscles, um, you know, it's not the painful calf muscles necessarily, but it's the ones that are weaker, that have to hold a lot of tension to do the work they need to do to move the body around. They're the ones that are atrophied. Um, it could be as a result of a condition like this patient's. Uh, it could be from a lumbar or spinal compression, and it's causing a disturbance in, in the nerve conduction down into the calf muscles and the foot. And any time you see difficulty flexing the foot, and this relates to the, the soleus muscle, the, the procedure itself relates to the soleus muscle. Okay, so um, I'll show you quickly on this screen uh, so that you get a sense of the procedure. So their position is they're laying on their back on the treatment table. You bend their knee to 90 degrees and you sit at their foot. You reach around with your middle fingers to do move one and move two. Move one and move two are performed at the same time. To position your middle finger on the right spot to do move one, you place it in the midpoint of the back of the calf between the two uh, gastrocnemius muscles, the middle of the calf muscle. You're going to be able to then push the middle finger to, to use the middle finger to push the gastrocnemius muscle out of the way. And you can push it a, probably about an inch and a half to two inches laterally, and then you'll be able to press onto the tibialis tendon, which is beneath the soleus muscle. So that's all with one hand, and then with the other hand, at the same time, you'll be using your middle finger on top of the calcaneal tendon. So in um, in doing this procedure, you need to ask the client if they're feeling the sensitive spot. And if they are feeling the sensitive spot, then you can go ahead and, uh, and give them the uh, treatment. We do the treatment as an activation. This circle with an arrow in it is, a, is an activation. You're going to pull towards you with your middle finger to kind of poke both the tibialis tendon and the calcaneal tendon at the same time, strongly. It's not a wimpy move, it's a strong move. You hold a challenge on the tibialis tendon at the same time as you hold the calcaneal tendon and you pull them. And you can see you've got slightly different directions with an arrow, and that's because one hand is, is left and right, depending on which leg you're holding. So you'll figure it out when you do it. It's quite a simple procedure. But, but don't be wimpy. Make this move count. It's very powerful when, when you get a response to it. So she came back uh, four weeks after with a return of pain in her calf, and uh, the tibialis tendon had returned. So here again, simple treatment, BRMs 1, 2, 3, hamstring and burning heel were, were performed. Now she still comes about every four weeks for uh, tune-up in a sense. She's regained um, so much of her mobility and her um, strength. She still has issues of, of this leg getting weak and thereby losing coordination of it. 
And that's her main concern, uh, is uh, maintaining the strength and integrity of her gait and therefore not falling. It's, uh, as she increases her activity, the chance of falling is greater. So it's a catch-22 in some ways. Anyway, she's done exceptionally well. And I'd like to say as well that you know, this kind of neurological affect from a condition like shingles is not unusual. We can see it throughout the body. You see it when it's close to the, uh, when it's on the face. You see it when it's uh, in the rib cage, in the arms. Um, you can have these effects quite profoundly. And uh, you know, five years after the fact, she was still able to salvage, you know, the majority of her function. It, it's a, a remarkable improvement. So a great, a great example of what can be done with bone therapy. This next case is an interesting case because it's a person who came as a volunteer, as a, as a class example of how to work on, on certain conditions. And um, he came after a very bad accident in 2016. He came in uh, the spring of uh, 2017. His injury uh, in that accident was primarily in his, in his lumbar spine. It's, it's herniated on both sides, and um, he also aggravated a prior neck injury that was a, a, a broken vertebrae playing sports when he was a kid. And um, that was in 92. It had, had always been kind of an issue, but he'd kind of managed with it. And uh, he had deviated his posture somewhat. And now he has a, a little bit of a wonky spine. And um, his neck kind of sits askew on his shoulders. But nonetheless, uh, since this accident, all is bad. He has severe back pain centered around the sacrum, severe neck pain. His arms fall asleep with severe, intense pins and needles. His uh, right big toe, his, uh, the great toe, is impossible to step on. There may have been a fracture, maybe not. May, you know, there's in any case, it's almost like intense gout that he can barely stand on it. He has severe headaches, and um, they're located at the base of his, of his uh, occiput. Um, you can see the lumbar hernias. He's basically immobile. Everything, every movement is painful. Constant spasm. He has a reduction in nerve conduction and uh, he, in his arms, and uh, leading to carpal tunnel, I think mostly in the right arm. Okay, so if he lays on his uh, right side, he, uh, the, the, the intensification of numbness in his arms and head exacerbates. So look, he's already very, very acute. And so, you know, what can you do with a case like this? It's uh, very challenging. You don't know what's possible here. He's had, uh, it's, it's many months, I think it was about six months at least since, uh, since the accident. He's heavily medicated. It's not a blind decision to just go ahead and choose whatever procedure. There's a kind of measurement of what he can tolerate and what he's processing during the session. I'm a big uh, believer in using uh, signs and signals, and I'll talk about that afterwards. So uh, second treatment, he came two days later. So that's not uncommon for me to ask people to come back that quickly, especially in neurological conditions. And that's perhaps my main reason for showing this case, was that I feel that uh, sometimes coming back sooner is better. I often do it with sciaticas, because the relief is often, after the first visit, only two, three, four days. So it's often good to have a three or four day follow-up after, um, after a, a a treatment after the first treatment for some of these conditions with the proviso that you know if they're doing really well don't come that's that's not the point it's whether the treatment holds or not is what we're trying to achieve so anyway he came back two days later it might have been a bit soon but either way it turned out that he'd ameliorated for 20 hours only and so coming back was kind of perfect so the plan was to do brms one two and three and maybe respiratory, and just see how he's doing. 
But then during the session, right midway through BRM2, a remarkable change of symptoms took place that led to the treatment being ended. So he stated that the numbness in the right arm switched sides to the left, like um, a switch being pulled or, or switched, and uh, the current just switching sides from the right to the left. And uh, this um, raised the concern that there was to the approved for his disability coverage and insurance. So he was now relieved in the, on the very day that he came back. And here we uh, did more, um, but in the lower part of his body. We did BRM1 and 2. There was no reaction to the um, in the arms, uh, like in the second visit. Uh, we did s the kidney procedure and the sacrum procedure when he stood up. So the most important thing on this third visit was not to aggravate in any way and staying away from an uncertain outcome regarding his neck. So we just focused on the lumbar uh, uh, hernia in a sense. So that's a hernia that is, I think, between L4 and L5. And um, yeah, it's very typical, but it's but it's you know intense pain that he's in. It's uh, some people's pain is greater than others, even though the injury might be seemingly resolved and no abject pathology that would lead to concluding why the, he has so much pain. So interesting case. Um, I spoke I've spoken to him since and. Um, He's unfortunately not on not on Salt Spring. He's um, away with family, uh, in a in a critical situation with them. So, um, you know, he's having a hard time right now, and he I, I know he wants to come again for treatment. So I'm sure he will because there's no question that it was quite a positive treatment choice for him. Okay, so um, how do we? How do we know what to do with uh, with uh, our cases? You know, how do we know how to choose what procedures? How do we know uh, what order to do things in? How do we know anything in, in terms of bone therapy? We have these, you know, recipe books in our manuals, notes of uh, our classes, but really, the most important thing I think is is actually. Just follow the signs and the symptoms. Just follow what is revealing itself. You know, in a in a successful Bowen therapy treatment plan, every time it's it's different. You always will follow those symptoms that that come up, even the symptoms that come up between um, the visits. Um, during the session. Um, I want to talk about that. Um, during the session, when do we know when to stop? How do we know when to stop? And here I've written vitality. We know by the vitality of the of the patient, how they're responding. Um, how they came into this, into this, into the session, and um, one of the important measures I use is I follow the hot spots of uh, of the treatment. I follow the hot spots that the treatment initiates when we do the BRMs. The first four moves of BRM one. Hover your hand over that area, and you will feel hot spots. You'll commonly feel hot spots throughout the lower lumbar through to the glutes. And um, this can be um, an indicator in the following way. Let's say you have a hot spot that manifests after you do BRM1, and it manifests in the right sacral iliac joint. Well, maybe you can do a procedure like sacral release. and you wait a minute and then that hot spot has receded. It's no longer receded. That is what gives me the green light to move forward. And um, 
you know, I'm not just sitting thinking of all the procedures I could do to an area to clear the hot spot. No, I'm being very specific, knowing, putting together the, the construct of their symptoms and the procedures that we want to, want to do to help them, plus where they're at during the session. So if there is that positive change, uh, then, then feel very emboldened and carry on. So it's a, it's a, it's a thing I do a lot. You know, we're taught when we learn the kidney procedure to feel for heat, but that's true throughout the body. You can feel it in shoulders, you can feel it in legs, you can feel it on the face. You know, these, these transitions of, of uh, temperature, maybe they're caused by the improved flow and uh, hydration that takes place in the fascia. Maybe it's just blood supply. Maybe it's nerve conduction. We don't really know, but you can definitely feel the heat. So that's that's what we do, and it really works well to guide you as to the limits of what you can do. And then overall, what are the limits of uh, Bowen therapy and software? Okay. So, I seem not to be able to change that screen. Okay. Um, the, the limits of uh, Bowen therapy for conditions of the nervous system, we, we have no way of really knowing. Um, it's an individual response. I think the first case uh, tells you a lot that, that nervous systems that are damaged can, can return to a, a fairly normative state. Uh, the second case I liked as an example, not because it's cured or anything like that, but because of the possibilities of using Bowen therapy in a dramatic symptomology like he had. And um, I know that uh, it would take uh, a, a lot of time, not necessarily a lot of treatment, but a lot of time to see his his uh, symptoms improve, but I would have no doubt of, and I'd have no lack of confidence in addressing his problems whatsoever. I'd have a lot, of, a very high expectation of what uh, Bowen therapy could do in a, in a case like his. Whereas some cases, you don't see a response uh, for a long time, and uh, you do have to give up. There are, are going to be limitations to, to this therapy. And it's not necessarily a condition that is treatable even. And perhaps it's the wrong kind of palliative care that, that we can offer. Okay, well, thank you. I think that's mostly the end. I'm going to talk a little bit now about Bowen Online and uh, explain for those who don't know about it what it is. And, um, it's essentially a portal for learning Bowen therapy. And it's designed as a complement to learning options such as the books, live classes, and live classes offered by any school and teacher around the world. Uh, students use the online lessons as either a primary learning method and follow it with the live classes, or the other way around. They do live classes and use these online lessons as a review for, for fine-tuning what they've learned, because everyone is learning Bowen therapy in a very condensed manner. Nobody is spending 2,000 hours learning Bowen therapy. So there's no possible way to be a master of Bowen therapy in school. Everyone has to learn on the road, outside, doing, uh, doing the work of helping people. So, so bear that in mind, that, that this is a very useful um, additional learning resource for you. And uh, don't forget to use it. You know, it's there. You can watch a, a video anytime and, uh, and gain the benefit of it um, on the fly. You can watch it on your smartphone nowadays. So there are even students and therapists that have no classes available to them, and they have successfully used the online lessons as their primary source of learning and are doing great things with Bowen therapy. You know, Bowen therapy is like a, a, an instrument. If, you know, if I was to become a master pianist, how many hours, how many lessons, how many concerts, how many ups and downs in the learning process would I experience? Of course, you know the answer. It's, it's massive. And here we are, we're learning in minutes this therapy. 
Well, break it down. Make sure that you perform as many of the procedures, the moves of those procedures on yourself, so that you can feel the effect of it. You know that when you do a move properly, it has a completely different effect than when you don't send a, a clear functional signal into the body. That there is um, and are measures of the, of, of, the, of the correctness of your moves. And um, you, know, you can get better by paying attention and uh, you're to your clients to do the best job possible of learning how to do these procedures. Great, so um, I, of course a webinar is never a webinar without an offer and um, so for this webinar uh, the offer is for you to have a lifetime access to Bowen Online uh, lessons including all future lessons for a one-time special offer of $1.99. So click below for the offer and uh, I'll make sure there's a link on the, on the, on the video page when, uh, when I get it done. Okay, and thanks again for listening. I'm sorry for those people who had trouble connecting this morning. It wasn't your fault. It was definitely my lack of practice and um, preparedness for the webinar. But uh, now that this has uh, come through successfully, the next one should be a, a cinch. Ha ha. <laughs> okay, so thanks very much and uh, take care of yourselves. Okay, bye-bye.